Imagine you're sitting at your desk with your ThinkPad on a nice, cool morning with your coffee, tea, water, Gatorade, I don't know, whatever you drink. Why are you getting so worked up over that? Either way, you're drinking a beverage with your nice business laptop and the unthinkable comes into your mind. What if we gamed? Well, you switch off the lights, try to open up Fortnite, only to realize, even with the power of a great keyboard, amazing build quality, and a hardcore gaming nipple, you cannot get a victory royale with these frame rates. So, the broke-ass hunt begins for cheap gaming power on the go. This search led me to adding an eGPU to my beloved ThinkPad T480, which was less than ideal in many ways. Which means I need to get a proper budget gaming laptop, and after minimal searching, I came across this for almost exactly $400. This is an ASUS Tough FX505, and after getting over the bulldozer flashbacks, it was time for me to see if a budget gaming laptop is worth it, or if you really are just stuck getting a desktop or going full jank with an eGPU setup. Let's get the basics out of the way. This is an ASUS Tough FX505. Mine came equipped with 8GB of DDR4 3200 RAM, a Ryzen 5 3550H, and a mobile GTX 1650. Yeah, the 8GB of RAM does suck, but we will get back to that. Also, a 256GB SSD that may or may not have come with us from the factory, I don't know, and a 48 watt hour battery with an RGB keyboard. And 1080p 60Hz Nano Edge IPS display, which, I mean, when I hear Nano, I think, man, nanopixels, that must be some fancy OLED thing or some cool other, nah, nah, they're just saying they got small bezels, which these aren't even that small, honestly, for me, but hey, it's a gaming laptop, size matters. The screen itself actually isn't too bad, it's just, it's okay. Black levels are fine, ghosting isn't too bad, and the colors are alright with okay viewing angles. It's a very meh screen overall, which, I mean, it's fine for gaming, but whoever initially bought this when it was new opted for the 60Hz display instead of the 144Hz you could have also got with this, which is kind of an unfortunate part of buying used laptops compared to building out full desktops. You really can't get it optioned exactly how you want it, but hey, it's cheap. You save a lot of money. We do got ports though. Well, some ports. On the left, we got three USB ports, one gig ethernet, full-size HDMI, nice, and a DC barrel charging port, and headphone jack. Not perfect, but not too bad, I guess. I really would have liked an SD card slot or maybe a USB-C port, but hey, it's something. Also, having a lot of USB ports on the left is nice if you're a right-handed gamer. Not so nice if you're a left-handed gamer. If those actually exist, I don't really know. I really prefer USB ports on both sides though, just for the options, especially for a gaming laptop where you're probably gonna be hooking up a lot of stuff like keyboards, mice, speakers headsets, storage adapter things, you plug them in and your games are on it, those, yeah. <laughs> what about the biggest thing that bugs me when it comes to laptops? Build quality. Well, this guy weighs just under five pounds, which is pretty heavy and it's pretty chunky looking, but it doesn't feel very dense, I guess. Man, I really am an exceptional tech reviewer. Subscribe for more hard hitting facts like these. Most of that seems to be from the top with the screen just being really flimsy and not sturdy. I don't think the screen actually takes up this much space. I think they just made it bigger to make the laptop bigger. It kind of has socked on your underwear on a first date vibe. It does have a nice fake cheap brushed aluminum finish on the top and inside by the keyboard though. It does attract scratches really easily and it's not amazing, but it does look good enough and it's not a giant fingerprint or grease magnet, which is perfect for gamers. And now this is the actual most important part to gamers. RGB keyboard. Yeah, it's not great. Keyboard flex is <laughs> significant, but I don't really think you'd notice it much unless you pound away on your keyboard like something something advertiser friendly. I don't notice the flex too much while typing, even if people who daily a new laptop every week would have a panic attack over this. The actual typing experience really isn't that great either way though, so it doesn't really make it worse. The keys don't really have much travel and it's pretty spongy, although it's not the most spongy keyboard I've ever used on a laptop. It's just all right. It's another all right part of the laptop. You can tell exactly when the key actuates and it's very easy to adjust to and I never feel like I'm missing key inputs or anything. Although I do hate the little nub on the W key though. It's not really needed and it's really uncomfortable. Plus, I'm a coward anyways and I'm always almost pressing S. You know, I want more representation for cowards, Asus. Also, the WASDA keys are clear for some reason. I personally think it's tacky but I think the whole gaming laptop industry is tacky. Overall, everything build quality wise is just all right or subpar. The laptop is actually in pretty good shape though, considering it's a few years old and everything but the trackpad has held up really, really well, especially the keyboard. And the previous owner has been kind enough to clean out the gamer grease before they sold it. That's cool. Okay, I didn't sleep well last night, so maybe the script is getting a little unhinged. So let's just talk about day-to-day -day stuff. 
When it comes to the trackpad, it is a little small and the middle is kind of worn out, but it works good enough for the times you don't have a mouse hooked up. It does have an interesting little quirk though, maybe it's common nowadays and I'm behind, but you can press on the trackpad almost anywhere to get a left click. And the nice thing is the click is very uniform and it does click every time. It doesn't feel weird or like you're missing inputs or anything. It almost always does the click. Although for right clicking, it doesn't really work as well. You kind of got to go down all the way to the bottom right corner and it can be a little finicky since a lot of the time it just ends up left clicking when I'm trying to right click. I could just be an idiot though. I've been told that many times. Thanks for the confidence boost, YouTube comments and Discord server. Join my Discord and you can call me an idiot too. Oh, oh, plug time. I only have a few seconds. Uh, join or uh, buy or the speakers suck. They're awful actually worse than thinkpad quality although this thing is quiet as a water-cooled mouse though when doing regular browsing or watching youtube videos which is nice what the hell was that analogy the battery that came with this has about 80 percent of its life left and well even without gaming it really doesn't last more than a few hours and it does even less while gaming which is a bummer but life is a bummer sometimes it really feels like asus compromised on basically <laughs> everything just to shove the gtx 1650 in here and make it look cool with rgb and angles and look at those angles bro angular man and real quick as always i really wanted to dive into the repairability of this guy because that is one of the most important parts of buying a laptop for me next to build quality taking the back off to get in is well really easy none of the screws are covered by little rubber stands or anything and only a few at the bottom are different sizes just take them out and pop the back off and man i love to see this RAM right here, two slots we can upgrade up to 24 gigabytes, according to ASUS. Really, really weird number there, ASUS. Mine came with eight gigabytes of DDR4-3200, so I went ahead and threw another stick in there, which is how I will do most of my testing. But I'll throw in a couple eight gigabyte tests too to see if there's any difference later. Also, for anyone wondering about me blowing the budget, it was $20 with free shipping for another eight gigabyte 3200 DDR4 DIMM. It's not crazy. You can also add a SATA SSD right here by taking out two screws and putting your SSD in this little bay and slotting it back in, or change out your M.2 SSD for a better one that isn't the 256 gigabyte one right here. And if you want to get an upgraded SSD, RAM, or even this laptop, affiliate links down below. I have three ideas and zero money, and I would like zero ideas and three money. Changing thermal paste is also pretty easy in theory. Just take off a few of these screws where the CPU and GPU dies are, and also around the fans. Then just take the whole heatsink assembly off, and there you go, thermal paste. Replacing the keyboard and trackpad isn't as easy as a ThinkPad, but with how easy it is to change the battery, thermal paste, RAM, and storage, I will take this as a solid win for repairability overall. So ASUS obviously realized size matters and had to make compromises. Happens to the best of us. But, <laughs> but were those compromises worth it? And can we actually get a decent laptop to game on for less than $500? Let's start out with how I started my T480 GPU testing. Bioshock Infinite. It's a softball, all right? Sometimes you just gotta, you know, whatever. I tested Bioshock in the intro area 1080p very low settings and got an average of 173 FPS with 1% lows of 130, which basically means you could probably crank the settings up to high and still get a solid 60 if you wanted to. Not quite on the level of a proper desktop size 1650, but pretty decent, okay? Also, I forgot to record while benchmarking this, so this was recorded separately after I took my 8GB of RAM out of the laptop, so yeah, I'm lazy and you can deal with it. Now, a 10-year-old game played well. That's pretty new for me. So let's try another 10 year old game, GTA 5. So GTA 5 low settings 1080p got an average of 126 FPS with 1% lows of 50. Not bad at all and the experience itself was pretty smooth. And I don't know why I still do Minecraft, but I did it, all right? 1080p 12 chunks render and simulation, that got an average of 142 FPS with 1% lows of, ouch, <laughs> 12, that's pretty rough. Minecraft was pretty stuttery, but it seems like modern Minecraft honestly isn't as smooth as it used to be across the board without performance mods, which is a real shame. Even on my main PC, I will get stuttering here and there with vanilla Minecraft. I also went ahead and tested Fortnite, 1080p, whatever the hell these settings are. And yes, I am playing as a chick. Yes, she is well endowed. And yes, this is the only skin I have because it is free and I have morals, so I will not pay for one. Anyways, Fortnite played like ass. No, it played it poorly. It... It stuttered a lot and had 1% lows of just 9 FPS with an average of 88 FPS. I would basically call this unplayable for me, especially since this is a first person shooter and a pretty competitive one at that. It, the experience really was just horrible. It's hard to even convey in video it was so bad. But I will say, I have seen stuttering too on my main PC with a 3700X and Titan XPP. Not sure if that's due to the new update graphics cards, or maybe I'm just stupid. Either way, major suck. Now, let's get to the real stuff. Red Dead Redemption 2 is how I spelled that in my script. Awesome. 
doesn't really have a great way to convey settings, so this bar thing here was here. There you go. 1080p benchmark, average of 81 FPS with 1% lows of 32.7. Super playable, not that bad at all, and kind of impressive for a mobile GTX 1650 in quad-core CPU. And lastly, Doom Eternal, all low settings, 1080p was actually a super nice experience. Really smooth with an average FPS of 91 and 1% lows of 59. This was a really nice experience, there really wasn't much stuttering. I think, honestly, this laptop would really shine with a 90Hz display. And I think it could actually push that sort of frame rate at 1080p, as compared to the 144Hz, which I think is a bit of a stretch, Asus was a bit optimistic. I mean, let's just be real. For $400, being able to play some pretty decently new AAA games is awesome. And they were totally playable too. You could easily pump some of these settings up to medium and have a great experience still. I'm not even mad about the 60 hertz display either. That was just optimistic on Asus's part. Like I said, 90 hertz would probably have been perfect. What wasn't so nice though was the fans. Holy hell, these things are loud. As soon as you launch a game, they just go into a freaking overdrive and drown out the sound of the game itself, unless you turn the speakers up. But the speakers are so bad, honestly, I think I'd rather hear the fans. But unfortunately, the sound of the jet engines mounted under this laptop couldn't keep me from hearing the CPU melt a hole into the bottom of my desk since it couldn't keep itself cool at all while gaming. It just loved to stay pegged at 80 degrees, even when the GPU could stay uh, mostly cool. Pretty unfortunate. Also, before productivity, real quick, let's take my stick of RAM out and see how that changed performance. Doomer got an average of 87 FPS with 1% low of 59. Not in that much of a performance difference, honestly, but Doom could run on anything. This is also with a clean install of Windows 10 and nothing was open in the background at all. And Red Dead Redemption 2 got an average of 70 FPS with 1% lows of 33. So oddly enough, the 1% lows really weren't affected much by the lower amount of RAM, but the average was pretty heavily affected. Interesting. Alright, so let's talk synths. Bastards. Took my son. Also benchmarks. I put my 8GB stick back in for this. Actually, I never took it out. Timelines are weird. Either way, this is where not upgrading your RAM would really hinder performance, so let's just get right to exporting. I'm exporting in Premiere Pro in 4K with a bitrate of about 40 using one VBR pass and hardware encoding. That was really boring, I should not bother explaining all that in the future. Anyways, my 5D Classic video took just over 16 minutes and 30 seconds for a full 4K export. Actually, not that bad. The timeline itself was also pretty nice and scrubbing was mostly fluid without too many issues. Playback was great too, and it didn't drop any frames. Honestly, I wouldn't mind editing basic video on this with proxies, as long as After Effects isn't needed much. Throwing in my T480 eGPU video though really brings this thing to its knees quickly, unfortunately. That video just has a lot more going on and is too much for this poor little old gaming laptop. Also, Blender BMW. I don't know why I forgot about that. <laughs> Took just 1 minute and 14 seconds to render, which is pretty good. Actually better than my T480 with the full-size GTX 1650 I threw in there. And lastly, Cinebench R23 just for funsies. Yes, R24 came out, and no, I don't want to switch yet. I am lazy. That got a score of 3962, which is kind of a bummer. On par with a 4850HQ and about a thousand points short of an i7-1165G7 at 28 watts. Mobile chips have seriously come a long way in the past few years. But the CPU did stay cool for the most part, staying at around 70 degrees, which means the laptop struggles to get rid of the heat while the GPU and CPU are both working, not just when it's the CPU. I'm not gonna lie, this is an awesome deal for $400. Yeah, you could easily build a full gaming PC that would knock this thing out of the water, but after factoring in a monitor, keyboard, mouse, you'd still be on top, but you couldn't take it anywhere, which is where most of your money goes when it comes to gaming laptops. Even though this is super, super mediocre for the most part, it can game well, which is why you buy a gaming laptop at the end of the day. If you are interested though in getting the most performance for your dollar at the expense of portability, actually this is about as far from portable as you can get. Anyways, my Jank Station build is probably going to be one of your best bets, so check that video out if you would like some hardcore gaming on a budget. Also, subscribe.